I'm Linda Nickel. Leslie Sessoms is here with me, and we are the moderators for the Facebook page, Texas Women Photographers Circle. Some of you may not be on Facebook, so we've created an Instagram page at Texas Women Photographers, and we post all of the monthly meetings so that you can join us. Our guest tonight is Ruth Hoyt. Ruth is a wildlife photographer, writer, and a field guide based in deep South Texas. She has taught and led workshops for the National Park System, and her work has been exhibited by the Smithsonian Institute of America. Ruth's images have been published by National Geographic Books, The Nature Conservancy, Texas Monthly, and the Texas Wildlife Association, just to name a few. In tonight's presentation, Composition for Wildlife Photography, Ruth will talk about the four aspects that she considers essential in making a great photograph. She'll touch on the importance of focus, exposure, composition, and content to help your wildlife images stand out and to help you understand how composition plays an important role in helping viewers connect with your wildlife subjects. With that, I'd like to welcome you, uh, Ruth, to our monthly meeting. And, um, you know, I think I disclosed a little bit in the, when we were chatting off before we started recording. Um, this is not your first rodeo um, <laughs> doing presentations for me. And, uh, but this is your first one to do for the Facebook page, for the Facebook group. So I appreciate you saying, sure, I'll do it, Linda. And so, you have a whole new audience. And, um, you know, one of the things about this group, when we started this Texas page, we thought, well, it'll just be Texas photographers in here. And it's so, so much more than that, because we've got people from all over the country um, that have joined us. And that's pretty exciting. So with that, you know, I glossed over your bio. What do you, what did I miss? You didn't miss a thing. It's just fine. <laughs> all right. All right. You ready to jump in? Hi, everybody. I'm Ruth Hoyt, and I'm going to talk about composition for wildlife photography. I'm uh, on Instagram mainly, and my Instagram username is Ruth Hoyt Photo. My plan is to review photography basics, discuss composition, talk about techniques, and then answer questions at the end. So before we begin, though, I think it's important because it's important to me, I'm going to put this on you. I think it's important to talk about ethics and ethical practices and that you should learn about your subjects before you go photograph them and observe and anticipate what they'll do next and then practice these learned techniques that you're going to do. So I, I came across this photo when I was putting this show together and this is an old film slide from back in Colorado and um, I put the take only pictures, leave only footprints with it and to respect wildlife and give it space because this uh, woman is doing exactly the wrong thing. The moose are in rut and she's nowhere near a tree to hide behind. The rest of us who were out there were all hiding behind trees and she was upset because she could see us in her photos and we thought she was nuts. But um, anyway, uh, you, you don't want to put yourself at risk or the animals at risk, because when they hurt you, they get put to sleep. So that's, they lose their lives. So learn by using your senses. And I'm going to play a little bit of a recording here. Hope it comes through. I don't have, I don't have great uh, distance vision. So I have to learn birds by sound. This is all the same species. This is the Northern Cardinal and he's giving different messages. So back to learning by using your senses, this helps you locate and figure out where the birds are. There's a picture of two Northern Cardinals and they're going about uh, disputing over the space, this particular small branch. Um, I think it's also good to uh, anticipate and I'm, showing you a, a short video clip of the Laguna Seca Ranch at the Raptor Blind. And it's just a cell phone video just to show you um, 
what it can be like. They're very vocal, they're very active. It gives you plenty of opportunities to get good raptor photos. On that particular morning, it was just caracaras, but the other birds were around, they just weren't there at the time. So these are the kinds of pictures you can get. They're all natural, nothing artificial about them. They're flying, they're fighting, they're interacting. This one in particular has um, strong appeal for me compositionally because you've got one wing up on one bird and the other wing up on the other bird. And they're looking at each other and one has its head and neck arching over the other one and they've got the talons uh, showing on the top there. They do a territorial head toss and make a lot of noise. And that's what's going on here. This is a, a, a mated pair. They do interact with other raptors, such as the turkey vulture, black vulture, Harris's hawk, sometimes the uh, white-tailed hawk. Those are the main, main birds that you'll see at the ranch on the, uh, in the field there at the raptor blind. There's a Harris's hawk coming in for landing. And this to me is the quintessential shot of a landing bird. He's got both wings flared out, the tail flared out. He's got the sharp talons just about ready to hook into the branch. And you can see the eye has um, eye shine or highlight in it. So let's get on with the show. And I'm gonna do a brief review of photography basics. Some of you are artists who do photography and are learning photography. Others are like me, we do photography and we're learning to draw. So a lot of the same things apply. Focus is essential. If your bird or wildlife is not in focus, whether it's a photograph or a drawing, it, it doesn't work. Now, sometimes you might want to have a blurred effect. Um, you use in, in photography, if you wanna have a blurred effect like this, you use a slow shutter speed and as the bird or wildlife is running past you, you pan your camera with the bird and the bird is relatively sharp and then you get the blurred background. Some of you might want something that's super sharp though. And so I do close-ups and this was uh, taken after a rain and you can see in the bottom of the, the cactus flower, uh, it's, it's got a bunch of water in it. So it's a, it's a wet morning, it had just rained and this bee was climbing out. Exposure. Next to focus, exposure is the most important. And I do a lot of uh, photography at different times of the day, including night photography. This is a barn owl uh, bringing a rodent to the nest and it is a nest box that it's returning to. But um, we set up equipment at night. Well, we set it up in the afternoon and then uh, the bird takes his own picture. So we're not there to disturb him. Here we've got a roseate spoonbill and the exposure on this one is tricky because he's got a white neck, uh, almost black legs. And then the light is coming through the, the backside of his feathers, his wings. And so you wanna get the right exposure and you'll learn with practice. When you see that you've got something white in your, um, in your frame, or you're going to have something white in the frame, you have to make sure that you don't blow your whites because if they're, if they're blown out, they really don't come back. The same thing with the blacks. If you get too dark, you just, you just have to have the right exposure. And then composition, which is going to be our main talk tonight. And I will come back to that, but composition is the arrangement of the subject or subjects within the frame. And that is all determined by the photographer and how she uses her lens, whatever lens she chooses. So this is a uh, Pattaya cactus. I know this isn't wildlife, uh, but it is a uh, native cactus on, uh, on one of the ranches in deep South Texas. These cactus, um, that, that mat of cactus is probably about 10 feet from beginning to end, front to back. And it was um, slightly overcast that morning. So you have some directional light from above. You can see on the, the young tree that's above the cactus, there's light on the top side and uh, 
a little bit darker on the bottom side of the branches. So you do see your light source. When you look down at the flowers, it, you can see that uh, on the tops of the cactus, there's light there. Anyway, so I photographed a bunch of that, um, of that cactus mat. And I was standing on my tiptoes to get this. I was using a super wide lens because I wanted to get all of the cactus. And after a while, I got tired of standing on my tiptoes. And eventually I went, I call it, went to the ground. Um, I do a lot of close up work. And so this is a side view of that same patch of cactus. And I started working on bees as they were flying over. And then the final, um, aspect of photography. Uh, and it can be whether you're taking the picture or looking at somebody else's picture. You look for focus, exposure, composition, and content are the story that the photo is telling. You may not realize that you're thinking these things while you're doing it, but you are. So this is a story, uh, a storytelling picture. It's a female Roseate skimmer, which is a dragonfly down here in South Texas. And what she's doing is she's methodically dipping her tail into the water. And each time she dips her tail into the water, she's dropping eggs in the water. They will hatch. And um, if they don't get eaten, they will eventually develop into a dragonfly also. So this is a storytelling picture. And because of the water splashing, you can see that there's some activity going on. Once the dragonfly nymph uh, is ready to emerge and become a, uh, an adult dragonfly, it will crawl up a reed or a stick or sometimes the photo blind window. It's just whatever it finds to go up. Now, this is not a, um, it's not a, a roseate skimmer. This is a green darner dragonfly. So they're two, di two different pictures, two different seasons. But um, the green darner dragonfly does the same thing. It crawls up the reed and it splits its casing just like a, uh, a butterfly emerges from its uh, um, chrysalis or a moth comes out of its cocoon. It splits down the back and the dragonfly emerges and it's telling the story right now because its wings are not quite hardened yet and its body hasn't straightened out. So it's a story in the process. And there's one more factor uh, with photography uh, or art and it's called the wow factor. When you take a picture, when people first see it and they say, wow, you know, you've got something there. And that's what happened with this bobcat. I still love this picture. It's several years old. I was shooting with a 500 millimeter lens and the cat was only about 20 feet away. So I couldn't fit the whole uh, cat's face in the, in the frame of my camera. So I quickly took pictures of the top half of the head, then the bottom half back and forth, or actually up and down. I went up and down taking pictures of the top half of the face and the bottom half of the face and later um, had Photoshop stitch them together. And I know where the seam is, but you can't find it. I can't even find it and I know where it is. But anyway, for me, this is one of those wow moments because it was so close and it was a young cat and it was curious, so it didn't run. It's a very nice experience. Green Jays are rather vain. They're comical and they do the funniest things. But one of the things about them is they don't bathe often because they don't want it, but they don't want anybody to catch them looking unperfect. And so what they do is they come up to the water and pretend like they're going to drink and they'll dip their beaks in just a little bit. And they look around to see if anybody's looking and then they quickly dunk and then stand up and fly away very quickly. So to catch something like this is rather unusual. I've only gotten it like this only the one time. I've gotten other pictures of green jays bathing. I'm always on the lookout for that, but this was my uh, best green jay shot. And I do think it has the wow factor because I think it looks like a punk rock uh, hairdo it's sporting. So this is a long slide and I'm not going to leave this on the screen very long. If you wanna take a screenshot of it or take a picture of it with your cell phone, feel free because it has a lot of information on it. And I am going to talk about these things all 
briefly though. Um, and I've got at least one picture for each of these categories. So let's start with this right now, going in depth into composition. We're going to examine some photographs. This one is, it has to do with arrangement. I chose to take that picture like that. I could have used a longer lens and just taken one bird. It's a whole group of cormorants on the Rosaka down near Brownsville. And I liked using a shorter lens so that I could get the reflections. So you really have uh, two sets of birds and they're reflected. So it looks like there are a lot more birds there than there really were. So that's how I arranged the photograph. I chose a shorter lens than usual. Normally I'm shooting with a, with a um, 600 millimeter lens or a 300 millimeter lens. I like long lenses. So that's what the picture looks like without the word. Each of these uh, photos I've got are like that. I have the word first and then I take it away. So you see the whole uh, picture as I shot it. So balance and symmetry is part of photography and um, I like the way I, I put this old stump up and then planted the grass all around it. So it is a setup. Many of my photographs are set up, but there's nothing artificial about the birds. They're all wild. They're not tame. I, you know, we put food out for them. They come for the food, but they are not tame and they don't let us get anywhere near them. I'm photographing from a photo blind. All I do is set up the area for them to come and give me pictures. What I like about this one is that the, the male up on top, you can see the red uh, uh, on top of his head. He's got a red patch on his head. It's a golden fronted woodpecker. And he looks very proud and tall and has his beak partly open, which gives a little bit of animation. And then the female is looking up at him. He's not looking down at her, but I like the way she's looking up toward him and the tip of her beak points toward the perch that he's on. So your eye travels around uh, going around uh, from the top all around and to the bottom and then back up. Borders. Okay, when I'm teaching, I have a little bit of fun with this. I call it border patrol. I look all around the edges of my photos and I look for things sticking out or sticking in. And in this case, the only thing sticking into this picture is the bottom uh, well, coming from the bottom of this owl. This is a rehab owl, so it's not releasable. It has only one complete wing. The other wing is a partial wing. So it cannot be released in the wild, but it's an education bird. Um, the, the people who have it use it to demonstrate and show people and educate them about owls. Okay, I call this a busy composition. You've got a very small bird it's the black crested titmouse, and he's in the uh tree branch, and there are several branches, and they're all around him. The only clear path for your eyes to go is right into the eye and the front half of this bird. The back half is behind um, branches and flowers, so it's sort of a busy composition, but I still like it because there's some empty space on the left side and above the bird, and you know where your eye is supposed to go. That black eye just really stands out. Diagonal lines are always nice in pictures. So green jays, as I told you before, are very proud, very vain. They always like to look perfect. And yet sometimes they do things that are comical or not what you expected. I set up this perch with red berries. It's a yopon, uh, which is a, a native plant in South Texas. And I fully expected birds that would land on that branch, on the, uh, the old tree trunk and uh, eat the red berries. And I put the dead seed head um, down in the bottom right corner to get rid of some of the blank space that I had at the bottom. I could have left it like it was, but I just thought I would fill it in a little bit with that seed head. And darn it all, wouldn't you know, the green jay lands on the perch and I think, oh, he's gonna get a berry. I'm gonna get a green bird with a red berry. But no, he spots the little tiny seeds in that seed head. So he had me totally, um, totally fooled, was not expecting that at all. Emphasis on the subject. So our subject is a frog. I'm below frog level. That's pretty darn low. Um, I'm looking up at a frog and I've got uh, the sun shining in his eye. So you see all the detail in the eye, plus you get the sunburst in the eye. 
and the um the depth of field it looks shallow but the closer you get to a subject the more you lose your depth uh depth control so just his eye is in focus the skin below his eye is in focus but below that it's all soft because uh the frog is much wider than what my lens would allow me to have in full focus i would have to back off to get more of him in in focus so the emphasis goes on his eye the subject in this one i call it focal points when you first look at this bird do you see the eye or do you see the wings or do you see the straight top line from his head to his tail and down to his talons everybody will see it and perceive it differently um, but i've purposely positioned the bird in the frame i didn't position him he was flying but i framed it with my camera so that there was less space behind him and more space in front of him which gives him room to fly into um, when you're drawing it's the same thing if you've got a bird moving in a direction or it doesn't matter if it's a bird anything that's moving and has eyes uh, when it's moving in a direction, you want to leave space in front of it to give it a place to go where it's not going out of the picture. So there are rules, but they're really not rules, they're guidelines. So um, there's the rule, there, there's the golden rule, the, the, the golden triangle, the Fibonacci, the, the rule of thirds, there are all kinds of rules, but really they're only guidelines. If you look at this, I love the way the cactus sort of makes a mound. The, the top of the green cactus has the four uh, tunas. Well, actually there's five, you can't see the one behind the foot, um, but those are called tunas, the fruit of the cactus. So you've got red and green against each other. So you've got some contrasting color there. And then you've got the bird, which is only connected to the cactus by standing on the tuna with his foot. His foot was inside the fruit of the cactus. And so it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a tug of war sort of, there's a little bit of tension. There's the cactus down below, there's the bird hopping across the top of the cactus. He's got his wings out and balancing. Here's an example of the rule of thirds in, in uh, place. So I've got a picture of a coyote and I've purposely put him on the right side of the frame. If you were to draw a grid with two lines going horizontal and two lines going vertical, that gives you four intersecting points. And if you have your subject on any of those four points, you're going to have um, your photo divided into thirds. So the coyote is in the, the line, the vertical line going through both, both intersecting points vertically and then the left side of the frame is empty if you were to put something on each of those four intersecting points you're you would lose the feeling of the thirds the, the rule of thirds being in play and the picture would become a little bit cluttered and hard to read this way you know where to look you make eye contact with the coyote and you look which direction it's facing which is into the left part of the picture and there you have the picture without the grid and you you get that feeling of looking from left to right into his eyes and then right back where uh, i think actually it's a she where she is looking herself harmony and unity so those two words definitely go with a mama white-tailed deer and her fawn this is the first time uh i saw this fawn at the uh at the pond at the ranch and it hadn't been in water before and i've got other pictures of it as it's jumping around it's not quite sure what to do with the water and you can see it might look a little bit confused it was confused and the mama was giving it a uh um i guess some encouragement and and grooming it to give it some confidence so isolate your subject. I like to isolate my subjects from the background if I can. And this is just one of those super lucky shots. I was sitting there, I had, I was working on flight photos and I had um, a perch set up for the birds to land on. The female cardinal, which is the one on the right in the back and she's a little bit soft. Um, she was flying to the perch. And as she was flying to the perch, 
this male cardinal comes butting right in front of her and going to the perch. He, he crossed in front of her. And so she swerved to the back a little bit, but is still looking at him, looking back at him. And I just, I love the way that the, uh, the two birds are, are connected like that. He's flying in very boldly. He's about to land. You can see his feet are starting to come up to land and she's, she's veering away. Um, but it looks like they're taking a stroll in the park together like birds might. Keep it simple. There's not much to look at here. That is a full moon. This is real. It's not anything set up. It's well, it is set up, but it's um, everything is real in the picture. I took a piece of cardboard and put a bunch of pebbles. Those are very small pebbles uh, on the cardboard and then put the cardboard with the rocks, pebbles on top of the tailgate of the truck. And the, the problem was I was managing three things. I was managing the camera, which was on a tripod ready to go with a macro lens all set up and a, and a um, shutter release in my hand. So that was one hand was busy with that. The, the camera was trained on the, the pebbles with the, the moon. But the problem was each time I would um, try and take the picture, the, the millipede would not necessarily walk in a straight row, in a straight line. And so sometimes it would go left, sometimes it would go right, and occasionally it would go straight and have the moon behind it. If you've ever tried to photograph the moon as it's rising, every uh, minute or so, you're going to have to adjust your camera because when the moon rises, it's a fast rise. Tricky shot. Uh, leading lines. So there's not very much to look at in this picture except the stalk of flowers and the ladybug uh, getting ready to take off. It's opened up its, uh, the shell, the wings, and the, the wings are coming out and it's getting ready to take off. And if you look behind it, you'll see that there's a very soft white, well, it's not white, it looks like light green, but it's a white flower that's so out of focus that it just gives a nice halo behind it. If I were trying to perfect this shot, which I was trying to do, um, I would have had the flower more directly in front of that white blossom in the background, but I still like it the way it is because it's, it's very natural. There's nothing artificial about it. Negative space. I'm sure you've all heard that if you draw or photograph. Negative space is the space that doesn't have anything that, that keeps your attention. And this is completely all natural. Um, the grass was really there and I don't take things out of my photographs. Normally what you see in my pictures is what I saw through the lens. And um, I, the, the butterfly had been uh, puddling, which is uh, what they do on the edge of a pond. They, they uh, land in the sand that's moist from the water by the pond and they, they lick the, um, the sand with their proboscis. And what they're doing is gathering minerals that they need. Um, it's part of their survival tactic. Anyway, it had been puddling and it just, all of a sudden it lifted up and started to fly away. And I just happened to catch it. And if, if you, I don't know if you can see it as well as I do, but the, uh, the antenna, the eye, the proboscis, the body, the legs, the wings, everything is in sharp focus. Nothing else is, all the rest of it is negative space, but it's got enough detail that it's real. It's not just um, like a, a green, uh, a, a, what do they call it? A green screen or something. It's not like in the news uh, newsroom where they're flat up against something like that. Okay, so number of subjects. Uh, that was one of the topics. So I've numbered them. Here we've got one. It's, it's a very dominant uh, subject and you can see the horizon in the background. I'm in Curacao and it's one of the iguanas that was on the beach and I laid down in the sand. I put my hand under my camera so my camera wouldn't get sandy. My hand got the sand. And you know that I'm lying really low because you can see the underside of his uh, chest. I've given him room to look into. I didn't include any more of his body because if I did, he would really be uh, facing out of the, the picture. I keep saying he, it's probably a she. Here are two 
two subjects. Now, in this case, they're not looking at each other, but they're both looking in the same direction. They're both looking off to the right. So if you look at the two bodies, the way they, they don't intersect, but if you look at the curve, the bird on the left is definitely in an S shape. If you start at the top uh, of his, his head, you've got blue at the top of the S and the black face and throat make the, the first curve of the S, the chest makes the second curve and it goes on down the tail. So you've got an S and the other bird is not quite an S, but it's complementary to the first bird. I like the picture myself. Here's three birds, three subjects. And typically, if you have three subjects, you're going to have a triangle. We don't quite have that, but I, I kept looking for pictures that I did have three in the shape of a triangle, and I, I couldn't come up with it. But I like this one so well that I, I, I wanted to use it anyway. So you see the two birds at the front. They make um, it's a long, skinny triangle. If you if you use the eyes as the uh, the points or the corners of the triangle, and the tails are all pointing outward and then up, especially on the one on the right, and that sort of um, gives you a place, a line that takes you down. You st if you start up at the top right, you come down that tail, you come down to the first bird's head, then you go up to the other two, and then you go back. Or maybe you start, you know, some people would start on the left side, they go into the, to the two birds at the front, and then they go on down to the bottom one in the back and then up the tail. Either way, neither one is wrong. Here are four frogs in a log. And this one is definitely set up. I worked on this. Um, well, let's just say I put several hours into this, making, making sure I could get it right. Um, I'm using uh, one of the water tanks in a ranch and um, I wanted the log to float, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't stay in one place. So what I did was I put a milk carton under the log high enough that it wouldn't, um, it, the, the log could not float away. It was up high enough where it was stable. And I, I caught the frogs and I put them in the four holes. I didn't do anything to make them cold or, or dormant or anything like that. It's all natural. I stuck each one in a hole they all looked like they wanted to come out of the hole and they lasted long enough for me to get a picture. It's a 30 second exposure. It's nighttime. And what's using the, the, the light source for this picture is my friend's truck headlights. So the headlights, he's, he's got the truck parked way back and it's just enough light to light them up without making it too bright. That was a that was a hard picture to get. And by the way, when they started jumping, all of them jumped everywhere. So it was sort of like ping pong balls everywhere. Here we have five, and they sort of make a pattern. They're they're all on the branch. I've never seen five green jays on one branch at a time. I wish all of their heads were facing the right way, but they're not. But I was just happy to get five on a on a branch like that. I don't know what possessed them to do that because usually you'll see one or two green jays together but all five of them came they landed on that perch and i that's the best shot i got of them perspective okay i know i talked about this a little bit but may not have used the word perspective when i took a picture of the iguana i was lying down in the sand and that's what i'm doing here too it's a blue crab and i am down in the sand with my hand in the sand and my camera on top of the sand, uh, on top of my hand, so that I don't get sand in the camera. That would not be a good thing. Um, this is cropped. It, it was, um, I, I couldn't find the original, which had a little bit more space around the legs, but um, I like the perspective on this because it's got its eyes up. You can see they're standing up and the, uh, the brown parts on the face look like a mustache to me. Soft is another word. Whoops, I didn't take the uh, title off of that one. So soft, um, I like the soft colors, the soft composition. The bird is white. Um, the lighting is very soft. The sun has just come up and it's hitting the trees that are on the far side of the pond and they make a really soft reflection in the water. And there was just this little spit of land sticking out into the water and that bird chose to go right there 
and put its yellow feet down in that in that little spot and it, it it just made it for me the bird was too close to the edge of the water for a full reflection but you can see that the legs are reflected and then there's sand so this is one of my all-time favorite photos i like the action of the wing he was there for several minutes just grooming first he'd groom one wing then he'd groom the other and i just kept shooting it was so fun subtle and hidden okay i don't know if you see it but I'm going to give you a clue. The red arrow is pointing to the screech owl in that hole. And I really like this because if you didn't know that it was there, if this was what you first saw without anything else, you would never uh, guess that there would be an owl in that. Tension. There's tension in this picture because one snail is overtaking the other snail and there's tension in that the two snails are connected if you didn't know what was happening here because i didn't when it happened the uh the wolf snail which is the one on the right side is going to eat the other one on the left i did not know snails could eat snails but that particular kind does unusual I think this is one of the most unusual pictures of a green jay I've ever seen. Um, I was sitting in the photo blind. He was just sitting on the perch. It was just a bird on a stick kind of photo. He wasn't fluffy. He wasn't doing anything. But all of a sudden, he noticed a male summer tanager, which is a red bird that's not here year round, uh, somewhere behind me because he was looking toward me, but his attention went right to that uh, summer tanager. I heard the tanager call and he put all of his attention into that. And it was like the green Hulk. He just got bigger and bigger trying to make himself uh, look ominous and scary. And you could tell he was holding his breath because all of a sudden he just let it all out. And I have a sequence of that. It's pretty funny. Anyway, I think it makes an unusual photograph. So let's see. These are more examples and you can name them for yourself. I've given you all these words to think about when you look at pictures. Let's see what you think when you see them. I've got two green jay pictures. It's the same green jay. Here he's looking to the left. Here he's looking to the right. It's the same bird. If I go back and forth, there he is looking to the left. And if you start at the beak, go up the eyebrows and down over the head and down the back, you've got a nice smooth curvy line. When you go this way and he's looking to the right, some people prefer this one because he's making eye contact with the photographer. He turned around and looked directly at me. Here's a female cardinal bathing. And not too often when you're getting bathing pictures, do you get the eye where it's visible. And if it is visible, open. Usually they have their eyes closed or their um, eyelid over the uh, the nictitating membrane closed over the eye so you don't get any eye at all so you've got the eye the beak you've got the water splashing and you've got the um the the water going all the way around with a reflection there's a cardinal landing on a cactus a green jay upside down that's another unusual photo and could not find the original but you so you see my watermark on the tail that's one of the ones that i've posted on instagram at one time or another i had put some food under that perch for the woodpeckers because they do go under the perch to look for things and the green jay saw the woodpecker do it so he tried it too did not know he could do that got two red-winged blackbirds engaged in a battle they're flying upward from the from the uh the ground We've got a little tiny spider uh, on the right hand side that's lichens very tiny lichens and um, that spider with the legs and you know the whole spider is not any bigger than the pinky fingernail there's another female cardinal i've been the the female cardinals are starring so far and what she's doing is she's landing on this cactus and she's grabbing a chunk of the tuna, which is very good. I don't know if you've ever eaten a cactus tuna, but if you live in Texas and you get the the uh, get them off of the ranch, they're very good. 
You can also buy them in the store. I think they might um, send them to other states, but I'm not really sure. But they're so good when they're fresh off the cactus. The birds, the wildlife, all of them love it. And uh, it, at this time of the year, when the tunas are bloom, uh, not blooming, when the fruit is ripe, all of the animals get into this cactus um, in the tunas and they all have purple faces like little kids with purple popsicles. It's quite humorous to see. Even the wasps do it because they like the sweet juice. They bring the, the juice back to their nests. And if it's a, a paper wasp, the, 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 the wasp nest gets stained purple. This is one of my favorite macro shots because it's a tiny subject in backlight. The sun is sort of off to the left and behind this little damselfly. Each water drop, which is natural dew, I don't spray my subjects, but each water drop, you can look closely and see that there's a scene in it upside down. So each water drop is light at the bottom because that's the sky with the sun in it. And then the top side is the, the field of uh, grasses and flowers behind it. And I just, I just like that picture because it's got so much detail in it. And the little tiny uh, antenna are sharp on this. And I used a gold reflector to help the composition. If I had not used the, the gold reflector, the damselfly would be almost in silhouette because there was no light from this side of the camera or this side of the damselfly. The light was coming from the other side. Ruth, before you go on uh, past this photo, Susan's curious, can you, can you talk a little bit about your settings on this particular one? Because it's so sharp. It is very sharp. It's, it's a macro lens. Yep. Um, at the time I was using, I see, I know when that picture was taken, so I know what lens and what camera I was using. So it's, um, it was a uh, 180 millimeter macro lens. And I think it was probably like um, F11. And I was close to the subject, but it's small. So the subject is super sharp, but the background immediately falls off in sharpness. It's far enough away where it's out of focus. So those are, um, yeah, uh, well, the yellow is uh, the sun refracting light. The pink is flowers and the green at the bottom is just more vegetation. So it's about a, an F11. I'd have to look at the original to tell you for sure, but it's been one of my favorites for when I was shooting it, I was just, I was just praying that the, the wind was not blowing. You don't know until you look later if you got it or not. And um, it did warm up and it flew away a few minutes later. So um, I really got lucky on that one. Thank you. Yep. So this is a ribbon snake. And if you didn't know it, they have red tongues. I knew it and I wanted its tongue out. This one is set up and it is raining like mad outside while I'm shooting this photo. And what I did to set this one up, I don't mind telling that it's a setup. Um, the background, which looks like blue sky, is my blue microfiber cleaning cloth. The branch is a mesquite, uh, not mesquite, a, um, a huisache blossom branch that I clipped off before it started to rain. And the snake, I just put on the branch and let it do its thing. And it was quite content to stay there. That's, that's how they hang out around ponds. To get the tongue, um, if you just blow gently across it, they use their tongues to sense smell. And so, it, it, it was uh, tasting the wind, the, the breath from me. Uh, this is, I think, an earless lizard. This one is an old picture, but I really like the lines and the color, the composition. Your, your eye, if you start at the front of the lizard, you start at the, the, the head and the nose, the top of the head. You go down the head, down the back, and up the tail and it curves all the way up to the top. And the legs are just very relaxed. He's just standing on an old dead palm front, palm, how do you say that? Palm frond, yeah, it's a dead palm frond. And I just, I like 
the, the colors of the lizard because they're very much the same as the palm frond, the dead palm frond. I put this one in not because I like the composition so much, but just to remind people that compositions change. When you're doing wildlife, you don't have the choice of saying, put your head up, darn it, look at him. Uh, she's not gonna do it. She didn't, and that's, the, that's what I got. So sometimes you cannot control what you're trying to photograph. So you take, you take the opportunities as you get them and do the best you can with them. This would not win any prize in my book, um, other than it's two curb-billed thrashers and you see their beautiful orange eyes and the field behind them is out of focus. This is a photograph I took. Um, it was when I first got my uh, Canon 1DX Mark II or Mark III, I don't remember which one, but I was at the Raptor blind and I was just amazed at how fast the camera focused. This Caracara uh, flew through the the, through the area and was coming toward the photo blind and the scissor tailed flycatcher must have had a nest nearby and it took offense to the uh, crested caracara flying through and it chased it all the way in and I have five out of six pictures that are tack sharp like that. I only showed you one, but they're all like that. Here's a white tailed hawk, another raptor, very fast, very athletic. And this, this bird dominates the, the raptors down here. The bottom of the pecking order are the turkey vultures and black vultures. Um, the caracaras rule over them. The Harris's hawk rules over the crested caracara. But if the white-tailed hawk enters the scene, he rules. He's the playground bully. And what he does is he comes in looking for somebody to pick on and grab the meat or bone or whatever they've got. And he does. He just takes it away from them and they stand there and watch. <laughs> There's a green jay in flight. He's focused on this cactus and he's trying to decide if he's going to land or not. He ended up not landing. He, kept, he, uh, he pulled up and kept on going, but he was looking. This picture is a little bit, I'm gonna call it static. The bird is just sitting still on a stick or, or a perch. It's a Texas persimmon. It's green, the bird has some green in it, so it does tie into it. Um, the background is just dead grass and, and uh, in the field. And the bird is really not doing anything, but it's just such a pretty bird. I can't help but put one in. Um, it's got negative space behind the head, so the head and the face and beak really stand out against the background, so you can't miss him. So this is a buff-bellied hummingbird. That's one of our year-round residents in the Rio Grande Valley, and they love red sage plants and i bought red sage when i first moved to where i am and it took over my yard well, i shouldn't say took over i don't have uh the great soil that a lot of places do but it's scattered all over my yard so every year i get to see the hummingbirds as they come around and um anyway this one is set up the background is a painted background uh or a, uh, it's a uh, printed background it's a picture of vegetation out of focus and printed and put behind the uh, sage. The birds don't care about the background. They just come for the, the uh, nectar. Typical green jay, they're very vocal. They love showing off, spouting off. They, they're just very vocal. And uh, I, I've captured this one with his mouth wide open and in that pose, he's hunkered down and he's, he's really, uh, belting out a it's not a song they 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 make all kinds of funny noises but uh they're jays but uh i just like the expression and you can see all the whiskers around his beak um where the mouth is open a very nice expression on the face and he's got his head tipped back he's really into it there's a scissor tail fly catcher flying through the raptor area it was gathering nesting material in the raptor area and I, I was able to capture this photo as it flew through. Uh, it only did it a couple of times. I think it got a little intimidated with the, uh, the raptors around it. This is a very old film, uh, film picture taken on film. And it's taken with a macro, macro lens. It's a green anole biting the nose of a small Western diamondback rattlesnake. And I, I 
was laughing when I took that picture because here's the little guy biting the big guy and the big guy's just sitting there like, really? Seriously? And uh, it just, I was laughing when I took it. Just one of my favorite pictures. I used it as my business card for a long time. Here's one with, uh, I call it tension because you can feel this bird is about to lift off. It's not the cleanest photo because of the grasses around its face, but I use it when I'm teaching because if you look at his tail feathers, his wing feathers, and then look at the stump behind him, it looks the same thing. It looks like another tail and set of wing feathers. It's sort of a mimicry. Here's a Harris's hawk. It was raining and he was sopping wet. And I took a whole lot of pictures. It's a long shot. Uh, with my 600 millimeter lens across the field. And um, I used a slow shutter speed so I could get all that, uh, that water as it was coming off. I knew he was getting soaked. When you're watching birds uh, and you're watching them in the rain, they don't like staying wet for very long and they will shake off. I've got two pictures here from uh, Bosque uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, it's two sandhill cranes and they're lifting up off the water and the composition for this, they, they make a very gentle uh, curve, it, no matter which way you go left or right up or down there are curves in this picture everywhere. And so there are two pictures in this sequence, well I actually took I think 13 or 14, but I like these two this one. They're one right after the other and there's enough separation where you know that the one in front isn't going to kick the one behind it and here's where they. Uh, got a little bit more distance between them. I wish I had the one picture that was between those two. I think that would be even better than this, but I, I still like both of these. There's a curb bill thrasher and he's landing on a cactus. They don't mind, they don't seem minding landing on the cactus. And, uh, you know, they nest in the cactus just like the cactus wrens. And so they're accustomed to landing on the flowers or landing on the, the uh, tunas and not getting stuck with the prickles. I like the action of his, uh, his wing feathers are slightly blurred, but you can see that his beak and head and, and uh, eyeball are all in sharp focus, as is the tail. Just the feathers on the wing were going. This one is one that I took from uh, my float tube. I was in the water and floating around in the water with a camouflage over me so that the birds didn't mind me being with them. Uh, when birds see you in the human form, they're much more leery than if you're covered up like I was with camouflage over my head. And what I do is I float in an, a big old uh, tractor trailer truck tire with a piece of plywood across the front and then I rest my lens on top of that. And I float around in the water and, you know, covered in camouflage to get these shots. This is another one. This was uh, taken, I don't know if it was the same day, but it was within a few days, a yellow legs. If you look at, you know, we're talking about composition tonight. If you look at all the curves, the, the beak even has a slight upturn to it. So you've got the beak, then the curve of the head and the neck going down the chest. And you've got one foot in the water and the other foot is making a, a, like a Z. If you look at the leg, it's in, a, in the shape of a Z and even water trailing off of the foot uh, reconnects the, the bird with the water. It's an interesting picture. This one is um, a black crested titmouse. And I just like this picture, it's bullseyed. Um, sometimes it's okay to break that rule. He's looking to our left and not looking really at the camera, but looking in our direction, maybe looking over our left shoulder. And if you, if you would put your hand up in front of your face and cover the right fourth of the picture, maybe you'll like it better that way. If you do that, you'll, you'll see what I mean. I do that when I'm looking at the way to, um, to crop if I'm going to. But I, I sometimes like to leave them, uh, this one I, I just left him bullseyed and I use it as a teaching slide. Doesn't he look sweet? Um, this is a green jay taking a bath. He didn't dunk like the other one did, but this is, I really like this because it's in beautiful light 
you've got the catch light in the eye, you've got the arch of the, the, the plumage on top of the head, all that blue plumage is standing straight up and the black mask around the face has uh, feathers that are aimed backward to complete that curve. You've got this, you've got this big C curve all around his face with the way his, his feathers and the colors go. This is a golden fronted woodpecker and he's eating yopon berries. Woodpeckers love berries. And if you can find yopon plants with berries and put them at the photo blinds, you're gonna get woodpeckers. The woodpecker, well, you get other birds too, but the woodpeckers especially like those red berries. And I, I really like getting the male bird. It's not so much that he's prettier, but his eye is more red than the females and he's got the red patch on top of his head. So you've got all that red connecting and um, making him part of the part of the picture. This is a partial uh, leucistic um, pyroloxia. It's a male pyroloxia, but you can see that he's got white feathers on his cheeks. It's like he's got white clown makeup on or something. And he's also got it on his vent and under the tail. So um, that's very unusual to have a bird like that. And I like the pose. I just, I, I wish the, the flowers weren't cluttering up the scene. You would see the white better, but I still like it. There's a pair of tip mice interacting and some people won't like the one on the right looking away from the camera, but he's looking at his mate and they're interacting. So I think it's okay. I like the tail flare on it. I have a yellow rumped warbler and I've cropped way in on this uh, just because I like the color scheme in this. If I were going to draw this picture, I would love the, uh, the background colors. The, the sand is sort of reddish brown. The water is sort of greenish brown. And then you've got the, the, the log that he's standing on and just that little hint of yellow under his wing. And if you look carefully under his wing above the tail, there's a yellow, little yellow spot and it's much more, more prominent than what you can see. But that's the yellow rumped warbler. And some people call them butter bums or butter butts, um, but it's because they've got that yellow rump. The South Texas area is an agricultural area and we grow lots of aloe down here. And I've got aloe in my yard that I've planted. It's not native, but it's a crop that we, that we plant. And so every spring when we have uh, aloe blossoms, I like to clip them when I'm going to the ranch and see if I can get the birds to land on them. Some birds will and some won't. This, this male Northern Cardinal did. This Oriole, this is an Audubon's Oriole. Um, I think you've all seen the picture of me with the Oriole on my hand. It is this bird. I gave him oranges and he gave me that picture. This is um, another female Cardinal and I strung this vine. It was an old twisted dead vine that I found. And I just hung it near where um, the water hole is on the ranch. And darn it all, she was very curious and she landed on it. And I liked the picture so well that I cropped almost everything out and just have this funny face. It's not normally a flattering picture to take a bird with a beak like that straight on because you lose the, the, um, the depth of how long the beak is. Um, and the eyes sort of look a little bit bug-eyed, but it's a little bit I, I guess a humorous photo. This is another one of those birds. It's really hard to get. It's the yellow-billed cuckoo. And um, this, this is back in the days before my mirrorless camera. And as soon as they hear the shutter go, they are gone. But I was lucky enough to get this picture before he flew away. Uh, they're very shy. They're big birds. They're, um, I'm going to say... I don't know, they're more than a foot long. They're, they're tall, they're big, tall birds, but they're super shy. I like the, the, the feeling that I've captured here. And it's called the yellow-billed cuckoo. And what do you know, on the left side of the photo, there are some little yellow flowers that pull the composition together, I think. Normally, if he was like this uh, in the middle of the picture and looking to the right, he'd be looking out of the picture, but I think those yellow flowers uh, pull your eye back to the left and keep you in longer. There's everybody's uh, favorite colorful bird, the painted bunting. This is the male and he's landed on a little cattail that I stuck in the dirt uh, at the photo blind. And he landed on that, has a nice soft green background, all natural. 
I was walking down a road one day on the ranch and this road runner was curious about me and it went up. Normally they just uh, go trotting down the road with that swagger that they have. They, they back and forth, they've got big, long, strong legs and they normally will just, um, they'll run very fast, but with that swagger down the road. But this one was curious about me and he jumped up and turned around to look at me. Here's another pyroloxia and I had found this Tasajio cactus and it had red berries on it. And I put it out, you know, for the birds, you can see all the little white spots on the, the branches of the cactus. Those are where all the berries were. This bird had eaten all those berries. Well, maybe he had help from other birds too, but he kept coming and eating the berries facing away from me. And when he took the last one, he turned and looked at me and I think he was saying, thanks. So here's a um, chestnut sided warbler. It's a tiny, tiny bird. And he's uh, taking a quick bath in the water at the water hole on the ranch. And I like the reflection in it. Uh, the composition doesn't leave you anywhere to look except the bird and then the vegetation that's around him. The water, the reflection is uh, the same thing, just upside down. Here I'm on the Jones Ranch and um, I only have two male painted buntings here, but with those reflections, it gives the appearance that I've got more. It's an illusion. Now, if I were going to make a print from this, I would probably clean it up a little bit. If you look in the top left corner under the second bird's beak, there's a circle. And what that is, is a water drop that's on a blade of grass on the edge of the pond and the sun has refracted through it. There's actually an echo of another one right next to it to the left, very faint, but um, I'm not making a print of it, so it's okay. This is um, another one of my favorites. It's an action shot because this, this uh, Northern Cardinal was trying to decide whether to take a bath or to drink, and he kept drinking. And he was, it was like he was playing with the water. And I just happened to catch, well, the camera caught the, the drop of water that flipped out of his mouth. And it's also reflected in the water below. I just, uh, one of my favorites. It's fun to show all these old favorites. I don't uh, ever see doves bathing. I don't know why, but I just never catch them bathing. This one didn't bathe, but it was drinking and it was um, fluttering at the same time. This one is cropped too tightly, I believe, but I like to tell that when I'm talking about composition, I think it needs more room around it, a little bit more room around the tail and a lot more room around the head and the front where the frog's leg is sticking out. But it's a great kiss kitty and he's got a frog. And so I think it's a great uh, capture. Well, good capture for the bird too. He caught the frog and um, poor frog. It looks like he's smiling, but I know he's not. There's another paraloxia. Um, it's somewhat static because the bird is just sitting there. But if you look at all the lines of mesquite branches, they go along his body, especially the one alongside the top of his head. It has a point almost like the crest on his head does. Here you've got a male and female cardinal. They're not interacting. And I put this in intentionally because I don't, I don't really like this picture, but I put it in because I like to compare it to the next one. That's what I like. I like them interacting. He's giving her a piece of food and she's accepting it. And so even though you can't see his face as well, I like this picture a whole lot better. Talk about the water, um, you know, throwing the water when they drink. Roadrunners are comical to watch because they're sort of gangly. Um, they have a swagger when they run and they, they zigzag back and forth when they're catching things and showing off to their mates. And um, they have a lot of personality. And when they come to the water, they, they, they're messy drinkers. And I was able to capture uh, the water with the sky reflecting in the water that's coming out of his beak, which also, you know, talking about composition, it connects with the, um, the, the color around his eye. They have a blue patch around the eye. Some things you might not notice um, when you're looking at pictures or, you know, you're taking the picture, but the more you look, the more you see. 
there's a baby uh, curb-billed thrasher and it's begging for that little tiny seed that the parent bird has. And I just, I, I've always liked this picture because it's just sort of funny. This, this little tiny bird or the baby bird is going after this little tiny seed and the mother or father, I think it's a mother, um, is just, um, I'm going to say exasperated because she really doesn't want to feed it, but it's so insistent. She finally did feed it, but this is the better picture. Another baby bird. Um, most people don't get, uh, figure out what this bird is uh, until I tell them. It's a black necked stilt baby. It's only about one to two days old. And its mother was watching from nearby and he was just exploring in the pond. And he got in some mud and you can see the mud on the leg on the right. His, his feet were getting stuck in the mud. So he was flapping his little wings that don't have any feathers or any strength trying to keep balance. And he never did fall in. He did get out. I call this one Bigfoot. And uh, it's a I think purple gallinule. Am I right? And it's uh, coming along the edge of the water. Normally, these birds walk on top of lily pads and go hunting around the edges of, uh, of, of ranch ponds. But there are no lily pads on this pond. So he's just uh, gallivanting all around the edge. He was there for a couple of days. So I have lots of pictures of him. This was on the pond, uh, on the property where I live. And I put this in just, you know, this breaks all the rules. I mean, some of the birds are in focus, some are not. And the water is some in focus, some not. It's just one of those kind of action shots. Would I want it on my wall? Probably not, but I just like the action. You don't always have to have a good reason to, to, to really like a picture. I call this one getting your ducks in a row. These are black bellied whistling ducks and that's a log floating in the water. And the funny thing is, I mean, this is a still picture so you can't see it, but what's happening is the log is slowly rotating. So it's like they're a log rolling team. Bunch of baby chicks. This is Northern Bob White quail chicks and mama is on the far right and all, all the rest of those are babies i think there was 10 3 6 9 10 yeah anyway lots of babies here's papa with four different different day different group of birds just different lighting different composition these are two hens bob whites and facing off i think in the background, you see a male Bob White, and I think the, the bird that's facing away from us got too close to this male and the, uh, the mate didn't like it. There's a male running. They have the white face. His crest is up and he's running. Here's an altercation between two different species. On the left, you've got a Pyroloxia. On the right, you've got a curb-billed thrasher. The, the curb-billed thrasher was there first. The Pyroloxia evidently didn't see it when it was uh, coming to land on the perch and uh, got the evil eye. Another crested caracara. This one's just standing. It's a very static picture, but I like to put a variety of pictures in my uh, program so that you have a lot of different things to think about afterwards. When you watch the replay, I think you'll pick up on some of those things that I might not have said. This looks like a giant sparrow, but it's not. It's a red winged blackbird, and it looks like it's a juvenile male. Uh, the females and the juvenile males look a lot alike, but the males tend to have a little bit of rose color under their throats and a little bit of a pinkish hue on uh, their wings. We're coming to the end. This is the last picture. And what this bird is asking is, does anybody have any questions? As I flitted through here, I did not see any questions. I think you covered quite a bit of information tonight. <laughs> I talked a lot. lot of, that was a lot of pictures, Ruth. <laughs> yeah, well, I think on one of my recent programs, I didn't have what I thought was enough. So I probably overcompensated. But that's okay. That get, Well, you know, it goes back to you, you are giving a lot of examples because sometimes, you know, uh, we, we got some of the basics, but I think um, I liked that you went into the curves. That's something that I haven't heard you really talk about a lot in your previous presentation. So that was that was news to me. So um, let me gl glance through here really quick. Um, there's always nice comments in here for you. Um, you've, you've got some friends in this room, so that's always nice. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out the session so that uh, um, we can 
get this get this up on YouTube a little bit later. Um, Ruth, you're no stranger to my invitations, and I, I continue to appreciate you as a friend. And and I really love that you never say no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you back again. <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. So uh, ladies, you can connect with Ruth at ruthhoyt.com. And if you're on Instagram, please give her a follow at Ruth Hoyt Photo. Please keep an eye on the Facebook and Instagram pages for our upcoming programs. And then please consider joining us again next month. Um, on August 4th, we meet every th the first Thursday of the month. And on August 4th, Judy Royal Glenn will be here to share her presentation on hummingbirds. Where do they hide? So until next time, please stay creative. And I hope that we see you again soon.